Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Um, hopefully, you can all see and hear me, especially on Zoom. Uh, we've been having some problems this morning about sound, but uh, hopefully that's all sorted. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim. I'm part of the eldership team here at Mutley, um, and I oversee the, uh, the tech side of things. Uh, we're going to begin by reading from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blow blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have too, had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 400 years ago today, a group of Christians were in this city. They'd started off in the north of England, where they'd broken away from the established church and being persecuted and imprisoned as a result. In around 1607 and 1608, they moved to Leiden in the Netherlands. However, in 1619, they decided that in order to live as they believed God wanted them to, they would move to the New World and found a colony in what today we call New England. On a ship called the Speedwell, they traveled to Southampton, where they met up with another ship called the Mayflower, and they set sail. However, there were problems with the Speedwell, and they stopped at Dartmouth and Plymouth for repairs. In Plymouth, they abandoned the Speedwell, and most of the pilgrims crammed themselves into the Mayflower, arriving off Cape Cod in November 1620. Whilst they were in Plymouth, some of them attended what became George Street Baptist Church, now Catherine Street. And George Street, of course, was the church that founded Mutley. So the pilgrims attended the congregation that this congregation came out of. And for better or worse, they changed the world. And one of them, as Pam mentioned earlier, was my, let's get this right, great, 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 great grandfather, William Brewster. He was one of the leaders of the Pilgrim Fathers. So I have a personal interest in the story of the Mayflower. Stories matter. It could be said that one of the things that binds the human race together is that we are storytellers. Scientific sh studies have shown that stories activate parts of the brain that a mere recitation of facts don't. They blur the lines between what we hear and what we experience. There is power in stories. In the TV show Game of Thrones, one of the characters, characters says this, what unites people? Armies, gold, flags, stories. 
There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. No enemy can defeat it. Stories have the power to unite people, to inspire, to warn. It's because of the power of stories that many people are remembering the anniversary of the Mayflower's sailing. They like the good story. And certainly I'm inspired by my own family history. We began with a passage from Acts, the story of Pentecost. And I chose that because I think there's a parallel between the pilgrims in 1620 and the early church. We have two groups of Christians who are trying to serve God and who are aware that God is leading them to something new, something different. They've both been through some very difficult times, but they are striding out into the world. We have been through our own difficult difficult times, most recently with lockdown and the pandemic, but we're now looking to the future. Some of you may know that we are looking for a new minister in this church. I can't go into details, but there is progress there. So as we, as a church, look to the future, what can we learn from these stories of the past? And there's three points I want to bring to you this morning. Firstly, putting God in control of our story can lead us to places we can't imagine. Secondly, the story needs to be for everyone. And third, there is power in the story of the gospel. So firstly, putting God in control of our story can lead us to places we can't imagine. I sometimes wonder what William Brewster would think about his 11 times great grandson living in the city that he left 400 years earlier. Certainly when some people find out they can't quite get their heads around it. Surely the pilgrims went away. What, what, how, how are you still here? It's even more extraordinary when you learn that my family came back via China. My grandmother was born in rural Maine. She moved to Boston to train as a nurse, became a Christian there, and then felt, to be called, felt called to be a missionary in China. There she met a Scottish doctor, married him, and my mum was born a little bit, a little while later. Then the communists came to power and they had to escape very quickly. They settled in Scotland and to cut a long story short, I came to university in Plymouth about 21 years ago. My grandparents set out to China not knowing what to expect and yet they did it. And certainly their time in China ended in a way that they couldn't have imagined desperately rushing to Shanghai to get on a boat to escape. The Pilgrim Fathers also didn't know what to expect. I think it's hard for us to imagine what it must have been like to leave your home, get into a small ship and sail off over the horizon, not knowing if you would even survive the voyage. Then they had to found a colony in a land which, what, 100, 150 years previously, people in Europe didn't even know existed. Land which was full of strange plants, animal and people. Their following of Jesus led them to do something that was radically different from what went before. Real, practical action. And yet they did it. And what about the disciples? When Jesus called Simon, Andrew, James and John, and they immediately left their nets and boats and followed him. And the other disciples had similar stories. They couldn't possibly have known what would happen. And yet they didn't. But putting God in the driving seat doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to end well for us. Remember that story of after Jesus' resurrection when Jesus tells to Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. I think it's interesting to read Acts and to read about what Peter did after Jesus had told him that. To look at what Peter did in the Acts of the Apostles, bearing in mind that he knows how it's not probably not going to end well for him. When Peter is addressing that crowd on the first Pentecost, as we heard earlier, he's doing that with the knowledge that this is not going to end well for him. 
He knows that at some point, this is going to cost him his life. But he still does it. He's also aware that God is leading them to something new and different. Something radically different from one, what went before. A world where sons and daughters will prophesy, where young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. Are we prepared to take risks serving God? Are we listening to God? Is God speaking to us through our sons and daughters, through our young people and old people? Are we searching for God's vision for our church? Are we prepared for God's plans for this church to be radically different from what went before, based on real practical action? And as a church, are we prepared to put God in the driving seat, no matter what the cost might be? Second point is that the story needs to be for everyone. Stories have immense power, but they can also be dangerous. We can simplify the past, sanitize it. We love a story with goodies and baddies like a fairy tale with a wicked stepmother and the dashing knight in shining armor. But life isn't like that. There aren't goodies and baddies. There are human beings with all our faults. As Christians, we know that we are all made in the image of God and we are all corrupted by sin. We are all capable of immense good and immense evil. There are no goodies and baddies. And when we allow our stories to be sanitized, there is a danger that we end up with a story that confirms what we already believe, a comfortable story rather than a story that challenges us. I'm sure we've all had experiences of hearing somebody talk about something we were involved in, and we've thought, it didn't happen like that. Maybe they have painted themselves in a good light when you think they were at fault. Maybe they've taken credit for something you've done. Stories stick in people's minds, and if they're not truthful, then they can embed lies deep in our minds. So we need to be honest about the bad stuff in our history. It's no good to say it was all a long time ago, what does it matter? It matters when we start telling those stories, because those stories will influence how we think today. And the th truth is that the Pilgrim Fathers meant well, but their arrival, along with the arrival of other European colonists in the Americas, had a devastating impact on the Native Americans who were already living there. But apart from an appearance in the traditional story of the first Thanksgiving, their story is often not told. The truth is that the Pilgrim Fathers focused on the needs of one group of people over another. The gospel needs to be for everyone. The Great Commission commands us to take the gospel out to the whole world. Certainly on that first Pentecost, there were people there from what was then known as the whole known world. Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Crete and Arabia. God has put us in this time and place for a reason. And that reason is that there are people out there who need to hear about Jesus and to be shown God's love for them. God has put us into this community for a reason. There's a slogan on the church outside, a church in the community for the community. How true are those words? Who are we excluding from the story? Who are we not listening to? Whose stories are we not listening to? How do we make sure that in 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 years time, maybe 400 years time, when we celebrate all the wonderful things that God has done in this church, a group doesn't sit on the sidelines saying, yes, but what about us? Where are we in that story? And the third point, there is power in the story of the gospel. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the disciples were scared, hiding away from the authorities. And yet those 11 men and the other followers of Jesus started a movement which has led us sitting in this building today, thousands of miles away, 
2,000 years later. So what drove them to do that? Partly it was the Holy Spirit living in them. Of course, we can't have the story of Pentecost and fail to mention the Holy Spirit. But it was also the story of what Jesus had done for us. The story of how God, the creator of the universe, came down to earth as a small baby. How he grew up, spent three years teaching, and then was crucified. But three, years, three days later, he rose from the dead. And how through that story, we can gain eternal life. There was power in that story. It was that story that drove the disciples to tell everyone about what they had experienced. If we continue that passage from Acts 2 a little further, we would find Peter telling that exact story. It was that story that drove the Pilgrim Fathers to move across the ocean. It was that story that drove my grandparents to China. It was because of that story that this church exists. And it may feel that many people in this world don't want to hear it. But we live in a world wracked by sin, a world dominated by love of money, possessions, power and sex. A world that desperately needs to hear that story anew. And when we tell it, we need to remember that there is power in that story. God has done great things in the past and he will do great things again in the future. We began this service with one of my favourite hymns. It was written by another William Brewster descendant, so therefore a distant cousin of mine called Fanny Crosby, to God be the glory. So I'm just going to finish by reading the words of the chorus. And as we look to the future, let's remember that God has done great things in the past and will continue to do great things in the future. Providing that we trust and follow him, no matter what the cost. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen.